Ian Wilson is a former chief librarian and archivist of Canada. Appointed in 2004, he retired in 2009. He led the unification of Library and Archives Canada. How do you think that's working right now? It's starting to come into its own. Okay. It went through a difficult time as governments were trying to understand what it was and why. Was it cost-cutting? That was never, never the intent. It was done during Mr. Christian's time and continued by Paul Martin. The idea was to get synergies yeah. for the 21st century, for a, a digital world. As Rock Carrier, who was National Librarian, and myself was National Archivist, as we talked to people across the country, it was very clear they wanted access to the material. They didn't care about librarians and archivists they wanted access to original, authentic information about Canada, about the Canadian experience. Electronic the, access? Electronic access, yeah. coast to coast to coast, and we're pressing and pressing. We put phenomenal amount of energy into creating websites, putting materials digital online, from Mackenzie King's diary to all of the patents of Canadian invention to a thousand other things that are now going online and becoming available, the whole portrait collection, or well, parts of it are there online. No, can't we, find it that easily, or you couldn't. It's improving. Cataloging and descriptive processes are improving. The staff, I think, are beginning to understand the potential of librarians and archivists, with all of their specializations and interests, working together to make the documentary heritage of Canada available to everyone, in the schools now. Right. One project we started, um, Project Naming with high school up in Nunavut, digitizing a whole series of photographs that had been taken across the Canadian Arctic in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Magnificent, absolutely magnificent mm. photographs. Mm. Black and white, black, mostly? Black, yeah, they're all black and white. Yeah. They're magnificent images, but portraits of people. And they're all identified as Captain Jones and five Eskimo. The local people had absolutely no identity. It was only the European visitor who had identity, so what we did was start project naming, digitize those, provided them up to the communities across the north, saying, can you identify these people? And powerful, powerful, as people saw their grandparents as young people portrayed mm -hmm. in these. They began identifying people. That continues to this day. Like Wiki then, Wikipedia yeah, old, kind old of. Yeah, old photographs that are available up in the north, yeah. as well as in Library and Archives Canada collections here in Ottawa, and making them available. It's powerful technology. And that's what we began to do. As we digitized more and more, it became clear, I think, to both Rock Cartier and myself, that people want access. And that what we had to do was basically say to our librarians, our archivists, our technology specialists, our administrators, that everybody needs to work together to create a new kind of knowledge institution for Canada. All the recorded knowledge of Canada that we can collect, acquire, preserve, make sure it's properly preserved, make sure it's accessible. Those are the two keys, right? The, the, the preservation and the accessibility. That's right. Yeah. But I, I know at the time I asked the president of the Bibliothèque Nationale in France, Bruno Racine. Mm -hmm. I asked him, would this ever happen in France? It's just, he just said, there's absolutely no possible way. Mm -hmm. No. No, I was in meetings with Bruno Racine and his counterpart at the Archive Nationale. No, there is no way on earth those two <laughs> could ever work together. Um, it was fascinating, but... No, Quebec did the same thing. They put together the Bibliothèque Archive Nationale du Quebec, yeah. did the same. A number of other countries have followed suit. And you'd be surprised how many others have told me, for a whole variety of political reasons, we can't do it. Right. But we know it's the future. Because in a digital world, what's the difference between libraries and archives? In the digital mm. world, you want to provide access and the manuscript, the book, the photograph, the film, the newspaper, the documentary yeah. art, the portraits. It's all the it's maps, all an image, isn't it? It all comes together. Yeah. And it all has to come together if you want to do history and understand the past as a holistic place where everything was happening together in all forms of documentation of whatever format was being used that they are required. 
We knew this was a project of decades. It would not happen overnight. It went through some difficulties with government changes and a lot of libraries got closed. Uh, Mr. Harper's government closed a lot of departmental libraries. And John English recommended against it. No, John had basically, in his report in 1999, basically recommended closer interaction. That's he, right, he, yeah. He backed off of recommending amalgamation. Yeah. And I asked him why, and he said because he didn't think the professions would support it. And it took a lot of work. So they were ballywicks that they just didn't want to share? Is that well, it? they were just separate identities, separate professions. In yeah. the main yeah. building at 395 Wellington Street, the mm. second floor was the library floor, and the third floor was the archives floor. And people had not been to one floor or the other. <laughs> Coming in, you had to sign in and register for the library or for the archives. Why? Why not one? Or And then we were told, as Rock Cattier and I, we were both appointed the same day in July 1999 as librarian and as archivist. We were then briefed that this wall for exhibition on the main floor, that's a library wall. Over here, this is an archives wall. And we used to joke, can I borrow your wall? <laughs> <laughs> no, various things had grown up in that building, in that institution um, of separate identities. Mm. And yeah, librarians have an identity and that focuses on bibliographic, focuses on access, focuses on the public. Archives did great things, focusing on preservation, some access, but heavily on preservation. So mm -hmm. that magnificent building in Gatineau, the yeah. preservation center, which is now being added to, that state of the art internationally for preservation of all forms of documents, whether it's books or film or digital, Everything can be preserved in, in that building. So combining the two, emphasis on public and access, emphasis on preservation, it makes for a complete institution. Yeah. And gradually, um, I think the professions, certainly the schools, the universities have been ahead because at the University of Toronto, the graduate program there, master's and PhD program, combines library, archives, data management, and museums. Your degree in master's or PhD can be in any one of those. In British Columbia, library and archive studies are taught together at University of British Columbia. Uh, University of Montreal have similar kind of arrangements. No, the universities have understood that the principles of arrangement, description, the issues of acquisition, different ways for libraries, for archives, but the commonality around preservation, you preserve books, you can preserve manuscripts, there's some similar issues, and digital, it's all one issue. Why, why repeat it? Why do it twice over? But that by working together, combining the talents, not saying everybody has to be the same, but basically combining talents of mm -hmm. many professions yeah. that you need in a modern institution, you create a whole new kind of knowledge-based institution for Canada. That mm -hmm. was our intent. And I think it's beginning, we're beginning to see the, the real outcome of that process. And it's been a long, hard process. But nothing that you didn't expect. No, we, we knew that there was going to be pressure and mm. pushback. And um, we addressed it. And we yeah. just finally basically said, we're doing it. The idea that John English had proposed of some kind of commonality neither Rock Carrier nor I could see how it could work. We each had our legal obligations under our separate legislation and had to respect that, and um, it was difficult to see any other way. We just decided it was time mm -hmm. that this was a strategic response to the digital world mm -hmm. that in the first you know, few years of the 21st century, we began to see just how powerful an impact it's going to have. This yeah. was a strategic response. Many in the Department of Canadian Heritage never understood this. They certainly did not understand what was going on or why. And it was a long struggle, mm -hmm. working much more with the Prime Minister, M. Chrétien and Paul Martin, who had the vision of what this could be and what it should be for Canadians. Yeah. And uh, it gradually began to come together. Now, yeah, as you say, I mean, the... the, the the general public doesn't really care what's going on in the background. They want they want to see their heritage. 
you know, they want access. Um, mm -hmm. The debates that have gone on for years between librarians and archivists over arrangement and description, um, no, about acquisition processes. We could have had 10 years of debate over who preserves websites. Who preserves the website of the government of Canada? Is that a library issue or is that an archives issue? Mm -hmm. We could have debated that for a decade. <laughs> Learned papers, I have no doubt. We just said one institution, complete mandate to document the Canadian experience using any media at all, from radio and television to film to all the online media now that are being kept and preserved, all the social media, have it all together in one place and increasingly unify the ability to access it. Hmm. For a while, we began talking about is it possible to envision a national library and a national archives without a reading room? What if we're entirely online? What if we're digital on demand? People want to see see this, see that in Vancouver or St. John's or you know Yellowknife. Why can't we do it? Why can't we have full digital services? And I'm willing to bet the next decade we're going to see, it already is extensive, but it's going to be increasingly digital, 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 and full. I don't like the sound of that. Full, yeah. You know, well, the originals will be preserved, and those of us who love the feel of rare books and the good bindings, and who like original documents and touching the document that Sir John A. Macdonald wrote, yes, that will still be possible for a few. But mm. for high school students, for university students, wherever they are in Canada or, in fact, around the world, this is now a digital experience. And it does solve the the distance problem, doesn't it, in our country particularly? Yeah, given the size of Canada, it's always yeah. been difficult. You know, Library and Archives Canada has set up offices in Vancouver and in Halifax to support and encourage and have various programs uh, for digital on demand. The next decade, this is going to balloon, this is going to explode, this is going to be digital on demand, full yeah. access to the records of Canada. And, and the visuals possible. are only going to get better too, right? I mean, the yeah. way that, you know, that you mm -hmm. could you'd be able to see the texture of the paper and... Uh, You're never going to be able to really... You can't it. smell it and, you can't and touch really it. You get, get the, but the, the real sense it's, it is it. only going to get better though. It's going to get better and search is also going to get better. Well, that's um, good, because I that's the seen problem. there's some interesting new experiments going on right now with great success in um, optical scanning for manuscript. Mm -hmm. You can take uh, a journal, um, Sir John A. Macdonald's uh, diary or Lady Macdonald's diary. It could be turned into searchable text, just OCR, but for manuscript. This is something a lot of us have hoped for for a long time. The census records had to go to get typed out and entered into the system so you can make the census records searchable. And uh, now hmm. we're coming very close, I think, to technological solution. The other technological solution I'm starting to see is automatic translation. That's going to be interesting. This will open up. This will open up the historical records of the world, um, mm -hmm. and Europe's doing phenomenal things right now. Canada has to keep up. I think we're falling behind in some ways in terms of our digital presence mm -hmm. and making sure the Canadian experience, which is of interest around the world, and a lot of others want to learn about dry land farming that Canada pioneered or exploration or other in inventions of Canada. Or two nations living within one yeah, territory. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and the First Nations experience, mm -hmm. the indigenous people's experience, um, yeah. which is increasingly... Yeah, I, should, I shouldn't say two nations, should I? I might have no. to scratch that. <laughs> no, it's more than two nations came together. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the old school uh, that's right. history I'm reading. It's hard for Doty. Yeah, <laughs> which is where we're headed. Yeah. Okay, that was a good little uh, detour. Now let's get back to your education. You went to the military college in Saint Jean, Quebec, and College Militaire Royal Saint Jean. Okay, and and then you went to Queen's University in Kingston, mm -hmm. and that's where you wrote your thesis on Arthur Doughty. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And that's who we want to talk about today. He was the, uh, well, first of all, let me get to it, finish your career here. You, uh, 
worked at the University Archives at Queen's. You later became the Saskatchewan Provincial Archivist and then the Archivist in Ontario. Your 1980 report, Canadian Archives, has been described as a milestone in the history of archival development in Canada. <laughs> and you have taught at the University of Toronto. You were awarded an honorary doctorate from York University. And you are an officer of the Order of Canada. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Well, thank you very much. Good to see you. Yes, we want to talk about a uh, Canadian hero, Arthur Doughty, Canada's second Dominion archivist and keeper of the records. What were his dates again? Dominion archivist, 1904 to 1935. Okay. And I think he was, is, is a hero. Do you think he's a hero? Yes, I think uh, he was innovative. He created an institution. Largely, what Library and Archives Canada is today can be attributed to his initiative, his drive, his ability to present the case for archives politically in a way that the government would support as part of Canadian government cultural policy. And I think many in the cultural sphere, think Canadian cultural policy began with the Massey Commission, 1950-51. Yeah. No. MacDonald, Laurier, Mackenzie King, Bennett, all had a cultural policy, and it was brought into evidence in a number of ways. The main one for Laurier was through the archives, in trying to develop a sense of national cohesion by a common understanding of the national past. Yeah, and I... what. This speaks to is Doughty's ability to more than charm and impress people and become friends with them in, in high places. Mm -hmm. What explains that? <laughs> well, Doughty was an Englishman, born yeah. in 1860 near Windsor um, in the UK. Came to Canada in 1886, little formal education, but he was fluent in French and English. He, yeah, do we know where he got that from? Like, his, his education is a bit cloudy, his right? His education is vague. He always yeah. said, all the biographical sketches in his years, said he was educated at Oxford University. I've tracked, he was there for two months. He had a good two months, I guess, but was there <laughs> for two months. His MA degree from Dickinson College in Carlisle was an honorary MA. He never darkened their doorstep that I can find. But he was erudite, loved literature, heraldry. He was an expert. He was expert with watercolor. He was charming, a great storyteller in great demand um, at dinners and receptions. He knew shorthand? He knew shorthand, uh, which um, he saw as the language of the future, uh, the language of communication. And he, in fact, published Tennyson's Idols of the King, and in memoriam in shorthand in Montreal in the late 1880s. Two books, fascinating, but entirely in shorthand saying business students should learn from great literature, not from business letters. He was a character. He was one of a kind. Yeah, and his father was an upholsterer who died when he was four, right? That's so right. His father, his brother, his mother kept the upholstery business going for a little while. Okay. His brother was trained as an upholsterer. So was Arthur Doughty. Hence his love of fine bindings, his knowledge of leather, his, yes. of, of decorating books in leather and extra illustrations. He was involved in the, the um, crafts movement. He seriously disliked machine-produced things, and all of his books reflect their handcraft. There were, many of them are one of a kind, many specially illustrated, specially bound, specially printed. No, he, had a, he was an artist. Everybody who knew him said he was an artist. And it's just it just must be very frustrating though. Where did he get all this from? Like yeah. you don't know where he went um, to school, you don't There are no school record, there's no university record for him at all. He did live near an order of nuns where he grew up and I think who ran school for girls. And my suspicion, but I haven't been able to prove it because they don't have any record of his ever being a student. But I think the kinds of talents that he had developed, the skills he had acquired before he came to Canada, very much reflected the kind of education a young woman would have in the UK at that day, not a young man. 
Um, it's fascinating, but that's pure speculation. Yeah. But he landed in Canada in 1886, worked in legal and commercial exchange, began working with the Montreal Gazette as literary critic, and uh, went from there. He was on the make. He wanted to develop. He wanted to be recognized, visibility, published these volumes of Tennyson in shorthand, published a biography of Tennyson, wrote poetry, began to get involved in politics. The 1891 election, he was helping Sir Donald Smith, Lord Strathcona, in uh, being re-elected. Just yeah. before we continue, he took off, went to New York, and got married. Do you know anything about that? No, this was, it took an awful lot of research to find where he got married. We knew he had a wife. You know anything he, about her? No. Not he never there. mentions her. None of his books are dedicated to her. Nothing. Uh, there Sounds is like... no reference to her other than in 1910, we turned up a newspaper from Florida saying that she had died in a hotel room alone in Florida, um, there was a strong smell of gas in the room, but they concluded it was a natural death. What year was that? 1910. Wow. And there is no other reference to her. It said she had become an invalid, but we've never, none of us who've been involved in trying to track Doughty have been able to find out anything. There is no reference. He never references her. That's and, um, no kids? Frustrating. Um, from a second marriage, yeah, had one daughter who I interviewed her once years ago, but she knew very little about her parents. Very little. Um, she had gone off to convent schools and she really knew very little other than she did mention at one point that her mother in the 1920s had spent time in Hollywood. And that I've never been able to track down. <laughs> where, where that goes, I don't know. Um, okay. But. So he was ambitious. He uh, got involved in politics, and he, he ended up quite quickly uh, working for the premier of, well, Quebec, uh, private right. secretary? As private secretary to the treasurer, but effectively working for the premier mm -hmm. um, of Quebec. As, as he was bilingual, which was unusual in those days, and could write letters fluently in both English and French and in great demand amongst the ministers. Also, um, you know, he was really very personable and would help them with personal things and dealing with letters and correspondence. And uh, he was in demand and very well respected very quickly within the senior ranks of the Quebec Public Service. Now, there was some kind of controversy around the Battle of the Plains of Abraham that he got involved with, or, or research, right? Well, that's what got him involved in historical research. Prior to this, there's no indication that he'd done anything at all remotely resembling historical research. It was mm -hmm. all literary, writing poetry, small books of poetry, limited editions, beautiful things. But there was a day in 1898, the Premier Marchand, returned from Ottawa. He had been there for a meeting of the Royal Society. Félix Marchand had just become president of the Royal Society. And at that point, the controversy erupted in the quiet debates of the Royal Society over where was the precise location of the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. Um, there were news reports that the Ursuline nuns who had a lease on that land or who owned the land were had it surveyed potentially to turn into town lots and build on it. And this set off immense controversy in newspapers across the country about building on the sacred plains of Abraham. But nobody was quite sure where exactly were the battle lines. Where was Wolfe's army and where was Montcalm's army drawn up on September 13th, 1759? Where were the two armies located? Where exactly was the battle, and what land do we need to protect as a heritage site? And so Marchand got back, he was furious because someone in the Royal Society said, we don't need to hear from the French Canadian as to where was the battle of the Plains of Abraham. So he was furious. He sent for Doughty, said, I want you to track down, find the documents, find out where was the battle of the Plains of Abraham. 
Doty refused. Rather said, I'm not qualified. I don't know anything about this or how to do it. The premier said, you can do it. And whatever resources you need, whatever help you need, you need surveyors, you need uh, land experts, you need whatever, they're going to be available. Go find the documents. Tell me where was the actual Battle of the Plains of Abraham. And that was the beginning of Doughty's career as an archivist. By that so point, he got bitten by the bug, did he? Yeah, he was, um, you know, almost 40 years old and um, suddenly given this task. Right. And he went into it with phenomenal dedication, commitment, writing letters off to the war office, writing letters to Ottawa, writing off to everybody involved, and the descendants of Wolf Montcalm in Paris, in France, in the UK, <laughs> yeah. looking everywhere yeah. for documents because there weren't the documents available in Canada. Right. And he began pushing, pushing. He got the Governor General involved, Lord Minto, um, mm -hmm. got deeply involved in the process, fascinated by it all, urged him, uh, helped him, opened doors in the UK to official documents. And Doughty first did a paper for the Royal Society in 1899 on the probable site of the battle, which, by the way, led to phenomenal controversy within Quebec as to where was it, others disagreed and a whole lot of pamphlets being written to and fro on the phenomenal detail about streets and positions in on the on the plains of Abraham. Yeah, this this gets right to the core of what a what an archive is. It's evidence. That's that's right. If someone was trying to argue with him, he would pull out a document, is that it? That's right. Doc, uh, this is how Doughty learned the power of evidence, the power of the record. The record, yes, archives are cultural and many cultural uses and research and genealogy, yeah, absolutely. Mm. But they're first and foremost, they're evidence of action decision. They're evidence, the original evidence of what happened. He finally found the plan of the plays of Abraham that was produced by Wolf's army engineer. He got this, he got many other documents together. The thrill of the hunt. Yeah, I bet he, you. he did that one article. Then by 1901, 1902, he produces six volumes. Oh, my goodness. Putting forward all the documents on the Siege of Quebec and the Battle of the Plains of Asia. I'm quoting all the original documents he was able to locate to that point. And how many had he, put, had he those, located? Well, there were six volumes, very thick volumes full of documents that he printed. And oh, so the actual documents themselves he reproduced and put yeah, them in the books? he printed them, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't just a commentary then? No, no, this wasn't much of a commentary. It was much more. It was just... The, this was the evidence. Wow. And in six volumes, which he produced two editions of it, beautiful, he bound uh, many of them. I think at his own expense, I know he had to borrow money to produce them. Those, in turn, had great influence because he then became the expert on the Plains of Abraham. Mm -hmm. and any official visitor coming to Quebec were turned over to Doughty, take him on a tour of the plains and show him where the battle was and where this was and so on. And Lord Minto was very much involved, working, living at the Citadel in Quebec during the summer months, as mm -hmm. the governor, governors general do, and um, very much an ally of, of Doughty in this process. But in the process, Lord Minto became deeply concerned about the state of the historical records in Ottawa. Some had been damaged in a fire in the West Block in 1897. There were several offices in Ottawa dealing with records, several proposals around to amalgamate, bring it all together. Minto finally wrote a very strong letter to um, Sir Wilfrid Laurier. The position as archivist had come open, the first uh, Archivist uh, Douglas Brimner had died in office in 1902. And Doughty. here was Dor uh, and Dozy with his calling, his six-volume calling card. Yeah. And Doughty was there, expert, showing the value of documents, showing the importance of bringing the documents together, mm -hmm. convinced about the importance of pulling more documents together. So Minto basically wrote to Laurier saying it's time to amalgamate all these efforts. It's time to build a building for the National Archives that will be suitable and appropriate. And by the way, I'd also recommend this fellow, Arthur Doughty, to be appointed as Dominion Archivist. And um, this, in turn, was done. Laurier was convinced. And Doughty then went into this whole process with phenomenal energy. He was no administrator. Taking over and running a federal government department, 
you need to be a good manager. Um, you need to know how to manage <laughs> money and how to manage people. Dodi it wasn't big though. I mean, it wasn't no, a lot. You didn't have to deal with a, a manage no, a lot of 10, people. 10, 12, 15 yeah. people at most. But still, at yeah. Point. But still. But he knew how to put the argument forward and with great passion presented the argument for the need for documentation. The old history based on myths and unhappiness, the divisive history of English and French, of Catholic and Protestant, mm. of regional histories, Nova Scotia version versus Ontario version. The only way of reconciling all of them and bringing people together to have a common understanding of Canada was to have the original documents from which you would get the facts, and from the facts you will have a scientific history. So he was busting a lot of myths. Yeah, he was busting myths. He was following British Lord Acton and Cambridge Modern History and other examples of this new historiography based entirely on documents. And he basically argued, while it's up to individuals to produce and interpret history, government's role was to make the documents available. Government in this era had an obligation to make documents available, yeah. and with a common scientific historiography, English, French, regional perspectives would all get balanced with the facts, and we would have one national unifying history. And he, as you say, he had fire in his belly, yeah. and thanks to that, we have an incredible resource, yeah, yeah. would you say? Fire in his belly, and also phenomenally assured of himself. He would, to acquire material yeah. with government departments, but then he started going after the descendants of those who had been at Quebec and at the battle, or who had been, like Lord Durham in Canada, playing a key role, went after the descendants, asking for these in the name of Canada. We yeah. want these, it's for the Canadian identity, it's for the Canadian sense of nationhood. The newspapers backed him up. People would want to help build Canada's yeah. identity, yeah. wouldn't they? So it's not as if he's, it's not a terribly hard ask, but it's, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to help and, this guy, right? And to, and to him, it was an inclusive identity. Yes, he was an Englishman who'd come to Canada. But yeah. What he saw was the potential of English, French working together, because he bridged those divides. He, he worked in English and French. Yeah. He'd grown up as Anglican. He thought of becoming an Anglican priest. Mm -hmm. He converted to Roman Catholicism in the 1890s. He bridged the divides, and he saw the potential of mm -hmm. having one new Canadian form of identity, an amalgamation, an amalgam mm -hmm. of these different um, backgrounds. Um, well, it's nice, to, too, that that kind of fits with Laurier. I mean, Laurier was perfectly bilingual, too, right? Mm -hmm. And this, uh, and this was Laurier's primary objective. Yeah. So this to reconcile the people, to reconcile the different, the differing interpretations and understandings of Canada. So they fed right into that. I think that's one of the uh, another key to to why he's successful and a, and a, and a hero, is that he has this intelligence, this emotional yeah. intelligence to be able to connect with with people in power, but more than, obviously, more than emotional, he's, he's, there's an intellectual argument was, too, right? Intellectual, you see, Mackenzie King in his diary, when he first meets mm. Doughty about 1905, 1906, King says in his diary, most interesting man I met in Ottawa was Arthur Doughty. They had similarities. Both had looked at going to the church, both worked in missions, and both deeply interested in Canadian history. But he may not have been a great administrator, but he sure knew how to negotiate a really good salary. Yes, he did. He did negotiate his salary, and um, he uh, also worked hard to increase the budget, uh, get an acquisition budget so he could acquire material, travel budget so he could go off to England and France periodically, um, which he did. So basically he researched anyone that might have been connected with Canadian history from England and France, and he traced their ancestry and then made the ask. Yeah, he traced their ancestry and then would go after them. He that sounds like a lot of fun. Interesting. He was a great storyteller. He was in demand in the country homes around England where the descendants of former governors and uh, generals and so on had, were living. And they had taken documents home. 
So if he'd have been a stereotypically stuff, uh, maybe I'm being harsh here, but stuffy archivist, we may not have the record that we have. No, it's as much his personality. He was entrepreneurial. He was driven, and he had the political support. So he had phenomenal confidence. So, yeah, I was just struck. Uh, <laughs> one story he tells about himself was that during the 1908 tercentenary in Quebec City the 300th anniversary of Champlain's founding of Quebec, the Prince of Wales said to him one day, he said, I'm going over to Montmorency, I'd like you to come with me. And Doty said, no, sir, I'm afraid I cannot. I promised someone else to take them for a tour of the plains. Who else would say no to the Prince of Wales? <laughs> you had to have a lot of chutzpah yeah. to say no to the Prince of Wales. And self-confidence backed up by real ability and um, uh, an ability to work with people. As I say, he, was in, he was with both Minto and especially with Lord Grey, um, mm. Minto's successor as Governor General. Doty was at Rio Hall, I think, almost every day. And the Governor General, certainly Lord Grey, would walk going by the archives, then over on Sussex Avenue, walking by, would stop by and, and give uh, Doty a flower for his lapel for the day. Um, no, no, he was treated as part of the family wow. with Lord Grey. Now, how would this fellow, coming from an impoverished, I think, mm -hmm. early life, mm -hmm. 1860, just outside of Windsor, how does he become confidant? Well, you know, it's the same kind of question you ask right. of Shakespeare. I mean, how does how does someone like that, with that background, because, produce this? Yeah. It's, so, it's a, what is it? It's genius. It's personality. And yeah, he obviously lot. had. He had a good sense of humor, particularly yeah. about himself. Interesting. And, um, and what he was pushing was so obvious. Everybody saw it was in the national. It wasn't to do with Doughty. It was to do with the national interest. And yeah. uh, he wasn't pushing an agenda. He wasn't pushing a conservative, liberal, or any other agenda. No. No. He was pushing a sense of Canadian nationhood, which he saw as essential. And his works, his, the archives, and then the other area that were up around the beginning of World War I, he produced this 23 volume History of Canada. Well, let's just, uh, yeah. just to summarize, you, now you've read, uh, written the entry on Doughty for the uh, Dictionary of Canadian Di Biography. Yeah. Right, so I'm reading from that. And you say that allies observed that he had little talent as an administrator, but uniformly lauded his ability to enlist. And this could be advice to the prospective chief librarian, let's say. His ability to enlist politicians, journalists, donors, and gradually academic researchers in support of an active archival program. His forte lay in explaining, justifying, and in and advancing the archives as, quote, an important factor in the development of our national life. Okay. He did that. He put it at the center of federal cultural policy. And um, that's one of the major problems mm -hmm. of the last 40 odd years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been seen, cultural policy has been seen as dealing with the performing arts and, and the, the visual arts. Excellent. Absolutely. We need them. But heritage history also has to be an incredible part of, of the Canadian cultural life. It has to be part of who we are. And Why this, does it have to be? Well, because it tells us what we've done as a society, our strengths and our weaknesses. In any planning process you do in any organization, you look at strengths and weaknesses, threats, and then what's your vision? Well, to get strengths and weaknesses, you have to know what your society is like. Where are the division lines in the society? Where are the strengths? What's it accomplished? Then how do we plan for the future together? You, you learn from who we are, where we've been, what we've tried in the past, government policy. You've got to learn that, well, yeah, we tried that policy in the 1980s. It didn't work then. Why do you think it's going to work now? So let's keep learning from the past, build on it as we move into uh, a very exciting future. So, no, I think heritage, an active heritage program has to understand 
Is but we don't understand that anymore. The documents. Is that well, it? Well, yeah, no. You think the support's been there for museum. Museums are great. I love museums. But you only see a story that somebody has put together yep. for you to look at and see. Being I, filtered. Yeah, it's been fully filtered. And library and archives, you can go in and ask for anything they have. Anything. Whatever you're interested in. You can do your own filtering. That's right. Whatever, whether it's your family genealogy and genealogists are some of the greatest users, or if you're looking at First Nations land claims or residential schools for Indigenous peoples, you hear and, and you find in the archives the detailed record of something that's a different presentation, a different approach to Canadian history. And you've got to understand the good and the bad and the ugly in dealing with history. You're going to get that in the the archive collection. It's there. The official record is the good, the bad, and the ugly. And unfortunately, we better learn from parts of that as we go into the future. Well, the ugly is probably more important than the good. In some ways, you learn more from our, as individuals, we learn more from our mistakes. And yeah. maybe as a society, we also have to learn from our mistakes. That is not an easy thing to present, but as you go into a library and archives, those records are there. Yeah. They've been preserved, they've been maintained, nobody ever thought to ask for them until somebody comes along and asks about what happened with residential schools, what was that all about? And it goes from there. So, so we talked about taking care of the old picturesque historical writing mm -hmm. and, uh, and Dodie's uh, emphasis on facts, which are in the headlines these days too, of course. Uh, and original documents, then we we get to what you had mentioned, and that is this incredible 23-volume Canada and its provinces. That's an extraordinary series of books, a, a huge achievement in Canadian publishing. Quite apart from Canadian historical writing, just publishing 23 volumes with the first edition the author's edition, full leather binding, special watermark paper, printed in two colors, specially bound in Edinburgh, magnificent volumes. Printed there too, right? Printed in Edinburgh. How come they didn't print it in Canada? Well, we didn't have the printers who could just do that. Just couldn't, couldn't have done it. They just, the University of Edinburgh Press was able to do this. Okay. Um, a number of fine publishers were using it at that period. So this was but, 19... It appeared 1913, 1914. Okay. Um, the final volumes arrived in Canada just before the outbreak of the First War. The 23rd volume, which was the index, was delayed to 1917 because of the war. But they managed to get the author's edition. There was an Edinburgh edition, which was, again, a limited edition, but for uh, sale outside of Canada. And then there was the archives edition, which was to be more of the working copy for libraries and others to use and make, uh, make use of. I think the best way to summarize it, this was the cultural equivalent of railways and canals. Yeah. This was a nation building project. Dr. W.A. McIntosh, later principal of Queen's University, commented on it, basically saying it's not the kind of series that would be um, a model for the future, it will in fact create much of the future. That was yeah, the intent. Yeah. He knew it. Others at the time knew the whole purpose of that, and it's explicit in the editor's introduction to it, that this is a nation-building project. Yeah, let me just read this out here. This yeah. is Doughty's. Doughty's, uh, you call it his poetic style. <laughs> With knowledge, the prejudice and narrowness of sectionalism give way to an enlightened patriotism which vibrates to the sentiment of nationality and holds high above all else the welfare of the whole commonwealth. For these and other reasons, the preparation of a comprehensive history of Canada at the present time may be regarded as a contribution to the development of the dominion. Yeah. That was their intent. That's how they enlisted the financiers who financed it, incorporated as the Publishers Association of Canada. Yeah, government money wasn't involved. No, that was not a right. that was certainly not a government project. Right. Financiers put up the, the capital and the writers, all of whom were paid, 
the, all the writers, over a hundred different authors, uh, experts in different areas of French and English Canada, were commissioned to write various chapters for the book, and uh, they were all paid, as were the editors. And they sold out the limited edition, 875 sets were published. Each volume was sell selling at $16.50, 1913. Yeah. Which today, the whole set, the 23 volumes at $16.50, at $370 odd dollars. In today's currency, uh, the consumer price index today, it would be over $8,000 a set. Can you imagine a publisher today putting out <laughs> a series of volumes, beautifully bound, lovely printing, tremendous paper, guaranteed to last for 200 years, but that would retail for $8,000? <laughs> I don't think any Canadian publisher would touch that one. Well, here we, uh, we, had, uh, we talked about it before going on air. Uh, Mel Hertig is the only, you know, his Canadian encyclopedia is, yeah, the, is yeah. the only sort of comparable thing that we can think of. And uh, I'm not sure what that went for, but it was maybe 75 bucks, I yeah, think. Yeah, I got it somewhere. So there, do but, I, uh, yeah. I mean, it was a wonderful, took yeah. serious capital and yeah. serious organizing. And it was a uh, yeah, very impressive yeah. nation building exercise. Yeah. But mm -hmm. eight thousand bucks no, versus no. seventy-five. No, Canada and his provinces. That is a tremendous monument. Now, I think uh, I'm told Donald Creighton referred to it as a great doomsday book. Anyway, it was more than that. It's phenomenally influential. Just in the classroom, as in well the classroom, as yeah, in the library. I'm told by some friends who are specialized more in Canadian economics. The chapters in there about Canadian economic history by Adam Shore are still the fundamental source about Canadian economic history. Mm -hmm. Another chapter by O.D. Skelton, who went on to great things in foreign affairs with, uh, with Prime Minister Mackenzie King. These are fundamental. These are first-rate writing, pieces of research, based upon, as Doughty had always said, it should be factual, so based on the documents, the documents that had just come open through the archives efforts. And um, it was sold across Canada as an yeah. encyclopedia kind of approach. You subscribe, and that made possible a publication. Only the elite could afford it, though. Yeah, this was, yeah, they would go to politicians, they would go to judges, they would go to lawyers, doctors. Yeah. Yeah. From the list of those who were subscribing, it was very clear this was an elite. But they were making possible the publication, which then would end up in libraries, so that into the public libraries, which were then beginning to thrive, public libraries. And that's where the here. public would go and, and see And the them. public would have access to, that was the archives edition, much cheaper than the first uh, special edition. The leather um, bound, yeah. Yeah, much more simply bound. Uh, yeah, cloth bound, or, yeah. Cloth bound and um, available in public libraries and yeah. school libraries. But no, this, as a monument, as a, an extraordinary achievement of Canadian publishing, Mm -hmm. This has sort of been overlooked, I think. It's a great milestone in the development of Canadian publishing. And uh, nobody's tried to repeat it. Nobody else will repeat it. Yeah, that brings up the question. Uh, there was a real importance behind building and cultivating a national identity. Mm -hmm here, but also Lauren Pierce, that was one of his most important yeah. missions. Yeah. You don't see, again, in the last 50 mm -hmm. years, that's mm -hmm. nowhere. No, well, I think, you know, but the efforts of the Canada Council, the National Film Board, are all working on aspects of that. The museums putting out exhibitions about different aspects of Canada and the Canadian identity. No one talks about the Canadian identity anymore. Um, we use phrases like national cohesion. Um, diversity. Diversity, but still within a sense of, yeah, it can be diverse, but what's the common core value? What's the underlying? What keeps yeah. this thing together? The spread out, you know, thousands of miles from one end, mm. from one ocean to the other. But what did um, the, what did this uh, series of uh, volumes, uh, what, was, what was their ultimate message. Their message was, as he outlined in, in the introduction, this was to give a common sense of purpose, a common sense of who we are, a common sense, uh, a common national past. 
That's what he was trying to do, was establish the common... Common is the key word. ...basis of understanding mm -hmm. amongst the different peoples. Okay. Even mentioned that um, it was timely because of the immigrants who were populating yeah. the western provinces. Well, that, that, that decade was like yeah, millions. Was, yeah, millions settling Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and of many different backgrounds. Not British, but Central European and mm -hmm. elsewhere. And they needed... For schools, a common understanding. They, you know, what is this country all about? What are the values? Yeah. What, have we, what have we accomplished together? And therefore, where are we going to go? Now, the books were distributed May, June, July 1914. By the end of 1914, or July 1914, we were at war. And that, in turn, became a powerful experience for the country. And it also ended up divisive on the conscription debate, divided the country in, in a way that uh, we're still, there's still echoes. And so in some ways, Canada's provinces got superseded as a national experience by the war. Doughty then, he got himself, he recognized that. He had spent his time working on Quebec in the Battle of the Plains. He also knew from the first war, that with the Canadian effort, it was going to be a formative experience for mm -hmm. the Canadian nation. So he got involved in That's a war right. record survey to try and document all the Canadian organizations that were established to deal with the war. Then he became director of war trophies. Yeah, but a bunch, what is it, a bunch of German stuff that we yeah, brought back? bringing back all the, uh, the, you know, the great pride of Canadian units in capturing war trophies, the cannon, the artillery, machine guns, uh, helmets, bits of Zeppelin, bits you know, at the end of the war, aircraft, um, bringing them back to put on major exhibitions, 1917-1918 in Canada and the United States, to help with the war bond drive, to try to get, you know, this is what we're doing, our troops are over there and here are the guns we've captured. Um, yeah, and really tangible, that. yeah. And he, in turn, was involved after the war in distributing those guns to city parks and public buildings across the country based on the number of citizens from that area who had enlisted. There was a whole formula as to how many guns you would get, large, large <laughs> field guns, smaller field guns, <laughs> yeah. um, different kinds of equipment. The universities got the newest aircraft that had been captured um, from the Germans. The, those went to the universities for... Like their engines and such? Re research? No, the planes themselves. No, it's what I mean, though. Yeah. The, like the they engine the is probably the most interesting. Aerodynamics yeah. and yeah. what and why. There are very few of those left. Most of those using the same records in the archives that Doughty had used to distribute them in World War II, mm. they were all brought back together and melted down. Oh, for the used, Second World War? for the Second War. Right, right. Um, most of those, have, we, we don't see them in the city parks anymore, at least not the numbers that were there in the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. um, it was, um, but no, Doughty was very much deeply involved in that, and after the war, involved in forming Canadian history societies in London and, and France, of the descendants of the colonial officials and again, had with the Governor General, with Duke of Connaught, with others, basically telling them all, turn over your records to Ottawa, um, a tribute to what Canada did in the war, and if you don't turn them over, Doughty will get them from you anyway. Doughty had quite a reputation for acquisitions and <laughs> dogged um, pursuit of ac acquisitions. If he heard about something, he'd go after it and eventually end up acquiring it. So. It was uh, quite a character, quite a life for him and the people he met. He uh, did phenomenal things, and the books he published are really uh, collectible in terms of limited editions, special editions, illustrated editions, special bindings, special paper. Fascinating. As I said at the beginning, this was handcraft. Very much his style. Not factory produced. Yeah, there were trade editions of a number of them, but what he did was very much for uh, a specialist market. Yeah, just winding down here, uh, he encouraged uh, Canadian uh, historians to come to Ottawa, scholars, to mm -hmm. have, and I'm quoting you here again, or actually I'm quoting a, a professor 
Chester Martin, who said that the, the periodical gatherings of Canadian scholars in Ottawa had done more, perhaps, than any other agency to nationalize the historical outlook of Canada, to, obl- <laughs> to obliterate provincialism, <laughs> here, here, and to lay the foundations of Canadian history itself in sound scholarship and research. Yeah. Yeah. You see, Canadian universities were reluctant to teach Canadian history. So Doughty, to push it, in 1911, he set mm-hmm. up a program of a student from each of the major universities paid for to come to Ottawa for the summer to do research. 1921, that became the Queen's, Queen's University Summer School in History at the Archives. But then the returned soldiers, who became then Canada's next real generation really the first great generation of Canadian historians, just spent their summers at the archives. And it was a whole, it was a club, it was a whole society there. Some students were there, and they were all exploring these new sources and comparing things. Mm -hmm. Adam Short was there presiding, Arthur Doughty was there helping and advising, Arthur Lohr, later a great uh, historian Historian. of Manitoba and at Queen's, was there working with Adam Short. Donald Creighton was there, A.L. Burt. Um, um, but it was a, a kind of a unified, it was a unified view of the country. It, it was a club. It was yeah. a classroom. It was um, a, a, almost an inter-university family because many of them would then go back teaching at the University of Alberta, the University of Saskatchewan. They were alone as Canadian yeah. historians. So they would spend the summer there with you know, congenial colleagues talking about history and debating and arguing go back with all their notes that they would take home with them, write them up, writing the articles, helping develop the Canadian Historical Association, which really took shape in those discussions in the 1920s uh, around the archives. But this continued for my generation of graduate students Mm. coming up here to Ottawa to study and do research and being there till 10, 11, 12 at night, going over documents and learning and then going down to have coffee in the basement and talking over with other graduate students and some of the professors who were there. My my generation, we like to do the same thing. In the digital age, that's not happening that often. A lot of this research increasingly is going to be done from home, Um, and um, we're losing something in the process. Yes, it's much more convenient, and we can be much more thorough in terms of access to sources, but... um, we're losing that national debate that took place um, in the archives. And, uh, and it was debate and argument, what does this document mean? How does it fit into the overall story? They were mapping it out, doing the economic history, Creighton, E.J. Innes, doing the economic history of Canada, and um, Lohr doing the timber trade, others working on, and Adam Short acquired the records of Bering Brothers. British bankers. He had permission to go through and cut pages relating to Canada out of the records and bring mm-hmm. them here. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it was against normal professional principles, but he got a tremendous resource for research here. So. Okay, I've got two more questions. Uh, one has to do with the general public, and you say toward the end of the paper, the archives throughout Doughty's tenure was the place of history with open, informative exhibits. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that sort of tailed off uh, toward the end of his career, Mm -hmm. but uh, that's been a real sore spot for me and for many Mm -hmm. others. There just uh, just aren't any any significant exhibits that have mm-hmm. taken place at Library and Archives Canada for, for many, many years. Yeah. I just want to get your, your take on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was the place. We, we The National Gallery in the 1920s was still struggling. We didn't have the National Museums for uh, Canadian history. So um, it was the archives. Major part, yeah. you major say, sorry, part you... of their space was devoted to major exhibitions. Yeah, you say the archives was a public museum and an art gallery, a tourist attraction, and an essential stop for official visitors yeah, it, to the capital. It was a library, and this continued up until the 1950s. 
Mm. The new building, 395 Wellington, wasn't really designed for exhibition. The, the environment conditions do not meet the normal expectations. In my time, we ran a whole series of major exhibitions there, including we got the U.S. archives to lend us their original copy of the 1783 Treaty of Paris. Um, we were marking uh, whatever anniversary it was, and uh, of that document, which was basically the document that ended the American Revolution and recognized the existence of the United States diplomatically. And they lent it, and we had a major exhibition of all our documents and many of their documents. It was here in Ottawa first for a couple of months, and then it was in Washington. And for the first time at the U.S. National Archives, they referred to loyalists. In their terminology, the loyal of those we knew as loyalists were to them, um, traitors, and um, those who were reluctant to go along with the revolution. That was 15 years ago, though, That right? was 15 years. That was 08, I think. 08, yeah, okay. It would have been yeah, 12 years ago. Okay. But since that time, no, um, the Library and Archives has given up the first floor. For budget reasons, they had to give up any, even the, exit, even the uh, auditorium, mm -hmm. where every evening we had events going on in that auditorium. Yeah, I mean, that's what... New, new films from National Film Board, yeah. special programs from CBC, yeah. club associations, the genealogists were meeting there. And that's yeah. what they do around the world and in I National... I was there every evening. Every evening I was there till 10 or 11 at night mm, okay. for welcoming one group or another and taking part. Um, what happened? Well, for budget, budget reasons, they cut that back and also... The, for budget reasons, much of the money that was going into the exhibition program was removed from the archive's budget. I think it's appeared in the Museum, uh, the Museum of Canadian History, and now the archives is using some of their exhibition spaces for exhibitions. The Philatelic, the Canadian Stamp Collection, which is Library and Archives, is over in on exhibition in the Canadian Museum of History. Similarly, other exhibitions are on over there. We had planned a major portrait gallery, a National Portrait Gallery, right in front of Parliament Hill in the former U.S. Embassy. But that, um, for various reasons, Mr. Harper's government decided not to proceed with it, and the building has stayed empty since ever since. Uh, the building in prime real estate in front of Parliament Hill has been empty. Um, I guess now Mr. Trudeau has given it to the First Nations to use as their major headquarters in Ottawa, but I'm not sure yet whether they've yet uh, they put anything in place there. But um, no, the portrait collection in Canada is absolutely is a marvelous treasure. Well, that's well, a big part of what uh, yeah, uh, Doughty. Doughty started it, and he had the talk in the 1930s of the Canadian Portrait Gallery. Uh, a phenomenal collection. And portraits of at least a million Canadians. This isn't, wow. some think, well, this is just to put prime ministers and governors general. No, no, no. They've got places elsewhere in Parliament Hill and in Rideau mm -hmm. Hall for their portraits. This is about can ordinary Canadians from all walks of life. The portraits of Aboriginal people across Western Canada, the photographs taken in the 1850s, incredible. Now, of course, it beautiful. lends itself to online, which yeah, is, I suppose, what they're doing. Yeah. But still, you want to... Yeah, you, to get the grandeur <laughs> of them, right? Yeah, yeah, to really get the image and to see, to build the set, the story of Canada through its people, coming from many different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, everything from various portraits of the four Mohawk chieftains who went to see Queen Anne in London in 1710. Their portraits painted by Verels, the, the court painter. We have all four. They're magnificent things. The portraits across Western Canada, the portraits of immigrants arriving at railway stations on, on a rail yeah, platform fantastic. in Western Canada, yeah, yeah. poignant and totally about our, our Canadian experience. But um, the Portrait Gallery of Canada, which was going to do that right in front of Parliament Hill, the story of Canada uh, right in front of Parliament Hill, it waits for another generation to have the vision and the drive to do it. But... Um, the collection is well housed, well preserved, and certainly in my time, we were still acquiring additional portraits for it, and got some fascinating things. So, okay, and, but a lot of online, yes, you can access it. Yeah, it's for not research, it's, but no, you've got to see it. 
Once in a while, the, archive, the library and archives does run a tour of the vaults over in Gatineau. If you ever have a chance, take one of those tours. I will. The building itself is incredible, mm -hmm. and the collection is even more so. Um, it's well worth it. If you see that, you'll never forget it. Okay. No. What, one other um, observation, I guess, and that is... Um, I haven't read it, but I'm, I'm going to read uh, Doug Saunders' book called Maximum Canada. And basically, as I understand it, he makes the argument that we just don't have and haven't had a critical mass, a population big enough to support a thriving culture, a literary culture. So that, uh, and again, I'm just conjecturing here, but because there isn't a loud enough voice, politicians don't listen to it. They listen to other voices. And that's one of the reasons that we haven't had such government support. Yeah. Or is it just one individual that we need? We need it's, another genius. It's the power of the individual and yeah. what an individual can do. And that was certainly going to be the theme of the portrait gallery. Here are all these common, ordinary people who did extraordinary things. That's the story of Canada. Some need leadership, as Arthur Doughty provided, but you also need to have the political climate, the political environment to support it. And, you know, I've worked in the course of my career, you mentioned earlier on, Arklis at Queens, Saskatchewan, Ontario, nationally. I've worked with governments of all different political stripes, uh, liberal, conservative, NDP, um, and many variations within that, many nuances. Usually within the government, I could find people who were interested and knew the value of history, whether it was Bob Ray or in Ontario or Alan Blakeney in Saskatchewan. Got a Perfect. couple of NDPers. Yeah, or Jacques Chrétien, federally. Tremendous vision of what this culture is all about and who we are. They get it. Yeah, they get it. I'm tremendously support. Trouble is we haven't had continuity. A number That's of great problem. projects, have, for me and for archives I've been involved with, went down to glorious defeat with the defeat of a government. That happened on a number of occasions. That is the, the tragedy of being a bureaucrat. Yeah, the continuity is not there. And, um, and, and nowadays it's very difficult for a bureaucrat to get the kind of public profile that Arthur Doughty had. Yeah, if you say yeah. he had his own statue, and he was knighted. Uh, right at the end of his life, he was, mm. he was knighted. Kenzie King was pretty ambivalent about that, but was one of the last of the Bennett knighthoods. Um, but no, it was a time when it was possible to do these things. And there have been those times, provincially, you could get something done. But it depended upon the right circumstances coming together, the right people in the right place at the right time. So you don't buy this population argument, then? No. What, for literary culture? Look at Iceland. What's it got? A couple of hundred thousand people, and every book published in Icelandic will sell twenty to 30,000 copies. That's a literary culture. No, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't buy that. Uh, we've got more than enough. It's just not a habit. But equally working in, as I've been doing some work in recent years in the United Arab Emirates, they don't have a book culture. Mm -hmm. They don't read talking to them about publishing and doing other things, not really, not a thick volume of, of reading, but uh, it's not their culture, it's not their habit, not their what they're used to. Somehow we've got to build it in. So do you feel so, defeated? No, not at all. I, I see things happening, coming to fruition that I had a hand in starting, and some things are grinding and uh, moving ahead. Um, I think it's government cultural policy that needs some serious attention. Funding in the right places? Well, I think some serious thought. What does cultural policy look like in a digital age? Um, we have the Massey Commission from 60... 51? Uh, yeah, from 60-odd years ago. Yeah. Um, near 70 years now, we're marking. What's the new map? What's the new map for... What's culture in the digital age? How do we promote it? How do we use this new technology to promote literary culture? Young people are reading and writing far more than any other generation. They are, yeah. They're doing it in different ways. They're doing it online. They're doing it on social media. So how do we capitalize on that in terms of Canadian content, Canadian 
opportunity. And I think right now, as everybody is locked in their homes, um, waiting for a quote, a new normal someday, opportunity here to get and involve Canadians in their, their own past, their own understanding of our nation. So, but we also need more opportunities to work together. And this is what I think, you know, as we mentioned, the, the group of historians who got together in the 1920s, or those in, you know, I grew up, most of my mentors had been veterans of the Second World War. We had a powerful experience. They were side by side with, you know, Canadians from Nova Scotia and British Columbia and Saskatchewan were side by side mm -hmm. in Italy, in France. They had a national experience. I was involved here in the Forum for Young Canadians, young students coming from across Canada in the 1990s. Where is that? What do our young people have as a national experience? Where do you get to meet friends from the different corners of the country? bring them together. In person. In person. Have an opportunity to get to know each other, you know, get comfortable and not just stereotypes about what things are like in that part of the country or this part of the country. Get to know people. Anyway. You're working now on... Sir Arthur. What do you hope to do with him? I've done a brief biography for the Dictionary of Canadian Biography. I want to write a more fulsome biography of him and his impact accompanied by a transcript of his recollections. He wrote out part of his reminiscences, and I've managed to decipher his handwriting, and that's ready, <laughs> and a bibliography of everything that he published. I like to bring those together as one book, as a tribute to Sir Arthur Doughty, a great Canadian. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for doing all the work that you're doing on him. It's great to hear well, about him. Thank you. Thank you. I've been speaking to uh, Ian Wilson, who is the former chief librarian and archivist of uh, Canada and uh, consultant. These days I'm a consultant. Yes, Very sir. good. Thanks again. Thank you.